the Florida Writer Podcast, a discussion about writing and other things. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast. I'm your host, Allison Nissen, and today I am lucky enough to have with me Alyssa Jeanette. Alyssa, could you give us a 60-second elevator pitch of who you are and who you represent? Hi, Allison. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am an agent at Stonesong, where I've been for the last five years. Before that, I was a lot of things, but especially a, an illustration student at the Maryland Institute College of Art. So illustration is a big part of my background. I do represent illustrated works for children or adults. I also represent prose, fiction and nonfiction, uh, pretty much all over the map. I love anything that interests me, which is one of the reasons I love being an agent, because you have a lot more autonomy and a lot more opportunity to choose uh, from a lot of different topics and interests. So what do you actually look for, and I'm not talking genre, but when a manuscript comes, comes into your office, what are you actually looking for? I am looking, well, above all, I am looking for a competent writer um, because it is a lot harder to find than you think. <laughs> uh, and there are plenty of fine writers in the world, don't get me wrong, but uh, in terms of like, tr like true consistency, true quality, clarity, um, and obviously it depends on if this is a, uh, you're looking at a fiction project or a nonfiction project, but I think that regardless, those are the elements that overlap. Um, and then in terms of whatever kind of subject matter you're talking about, whether it's sort of prescriptive nonfiction or narrative nonfiction, um, the, the, the ability to communicate effectively is really the most important thing I look for. Uh, in fiction, or really, I mean, in anything really, fiction or nonfiction, I am looking for also something that interests me personally, because if I'm going to represent this person's entire body of work, I want to know that I'm going, like, I'm going to be interested in representing them for the next, hopefully, you know, 40 years. <laughs> um, so I want to be very invested in the things that they're doing and hopefully have a little bit of a sense of projection of the way their career can develop over time. Suppose someone has self-published something and now they're sending their second manuscript out for representation. How do you balance that if you're looking at representing the whole body of work? Generally speaking, I don't think that a self-published work is at all a career breaker. Uh, I do see sometimes see people sending me their second manuscript that is a sequel to the self-published work and there's really nothing I can do for them in that regard just because generally speaking a self-published work is not going to be of interest to a traditional publisher unless by some you know turn of events that self-published work blew up and then a traditional publisher saw that it obviously had some you know market potential and chose to take it on and distribute on a, tra a traditional level um, but if you've self-published and that project, you know, what went well or didn't, regard regardless, and then you come to me with a completely separate, totally different manuscript, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, I, we would have to talk about your self-publishing sales figures because, strictly speaking, you wouldn't be a debut if you're still writing new work in the same market. Um, but I definitely wouldn't call it a deal breaker. I, we would just need to talk about what, the work that came before and how that might affect the career moving forward. And what's new in publishing these days? Publishing uh, is pretty much constantly rediscovering things that aren't really new, but are pretty much being sort of slowly pushed to the forefront um, by people who are very passionate about them. Uh, rightly, uh, the n quote new thing in publishing, or at least the thing that is at the top of most people's discussions is with regards to diversity among creators and among employees in the industry, uh, racial diversity, obviously, but also diversity in sexuality, uh, and even in places where people live, because obviously publishing is largely a New York centric place, um, and that can be very challenging for when it comes to diversifying in all aspects of the word. Um, so those are conversations that are definitely developing further uh, than they did in the past. And in that case, it's new. 
Um, but otherwise, publishing is a very old industry that is very, very slow to change. So it's hard to look at any of the things going on, even though they seem like fresh, edgy conversations, they're really work that has been built up over time by a lot of very dedicated people. It's the same with the conversation about um, sort of group movements and organizing that's happening right now, like unionizing um, among publishers or collective action in general, like that's not really new, but it is rising to the top of conversation in a way that it hasn't uh, in the past couple of years. Did you get bombarded with authors who try to corner you and say, hey, you have to look at my manuscript, and then they, they don't let you up for air until you've heard their entire 25-minute elevator pitch? It has happened before, but I will say that it is, generally speaking, very rare, thankfully. Um, I also am not, I mean, this can happen anywhere, don't get me wrong, but by and large, I um, don't go to like a ton of conferences. I'm not necessarily in a position to be bombarded. Uh, but I, when I do meet people who are writers, just sort of in the course of time, um, I am not afraid to ask them about their work. Um, because usually that's honestly, usually a better way to sort of mean, not, I don't want to say maintain the boundary, because I don't think it's out of bounds to want to talk to a literary agent about your work either. Um, but to express interest on my end as a friend who is meeting this new person um, is, I think, maybe uh, to make that first move, I think, is a nice way to kind of feel less bombarded. Because when I say, well, tell me about your book, then that hopefully will open the door for it to be like, oh, that sounds really interesting. Good luck. Instead of having to be like, well, like, tell me what you think. Like, tell me if you would ever represent something like this. I mean, and you may still get that question. But at that point, we have the, I hope that we have the practice to be able to say, you know, that's not, that doesn't sound like it's for me, but keep doing your research and good luck. So what would be a piece of advice you'd offer to an author that asked you for some? The best advice I can give is to develop your community because it is, I mean, one person writes a book, right? But it, I think that it is so essential for authors to have people that they can go to whom they trust to give helpful and substantial feedback. Because as an agent, I don't want to see your first draft nine times out of 10. I'm here to polish it to the point where it's ready for an editor to look at. But I am not your editor. I'm not your developmental editor. So you need to kind of push things as far as you can before I see it in the same way that you would do it before you ever have an agent. And that's where I think having not only the community of people who can give you good critique, but also people who can support you, um, whether querying is going well or badly, whether submission is going well or badly, whether the book is received well or badly. Um, and that's just a, a great long-term thing to develop anyway because publishing is small and political in many ways and like very many ways and can feel very insular and can feel very clicky so to develop your healthy non-exploitative close relationships in the industry I think is really one of the best things you can do the second smaller piece of advice that I would also give is no agent is better than a bad agent or the wrong agent fit for you so tell me the craziest query letter you've ever received. I can't necessarily get into specifics because obviously I don't want to disrespect anybody who may be listening and know these people. But I will say that I did receive a one in particular that did stay with me because it was so, so off base from anything that I represent. Um, and it was one of those situations where I think this particular male author only sent it to me and probably sent it to many other agents uh, like me, uh, which is to say a young woman who, you know, he perceived might be receptive to any advances he might make because it was like a, basically like a, a clear, like self insert erotica. And it was just very strange <laughs> because it was not good. I mean, which is, you know, fine. That, and I, that's the value judgment. Some people might enjoy it. Um, but it was just a very surprising uh, thing to receive because uh, it, I, he, I think he did want to be taken seriously as a writer, 
but it's so it was so obviously unpublishable for many like obvious market reasons that it just felt really absurd and obviously like you know entertaining but like mildly embarrassing <laughs> I guess awkward would probably be the right word yeah it was awkward but I mean I, t I don't tend to take those things personally um, because there, it, there certainly was no attack in it. Um, I didn't, you know, I just never responded because we don't have to. It's, it's, at, at Stone Song, our policy is if you don't hear back by this time, it's a no. So I didn't get any nasty, you know, like, how dare you? I'm the next number one bestseller. Like, you'll, you know, you'll rue this day kind of thing. I've never received anything like that. Well, that's not true. I did once. But this, but in this case, it was just, okay, this is like a funny, slightly awkward thing that happened. We can all laugh at it and move on. And it was really no harm done to me. So what inspires you? I think that I'm inspired by these, I, I'm, and this has taken effort, I think, which sounds strange because when we think of inspiration, we think about, you know, things just happen, happening organically and like having the spark emerge. Um, but for me, and I think it is something that I've always had sort of like an innate interest in and like have felt drawn to, but something that I've, de I think I've developed in the course of my job is that I'm inspired by the small victories and being able to celebrate the small victories because like, this is a job and an industry where it's very, it's, it sounds like it happens all the time, but it's actually very rare to have the kind of enormous runaway success um that we perceive happens all the time to so many authors um and especially as an agent uh it's an incredibly rejection heavy business it's very hard work and it's very easy to get overwhelmed by the idea that you are failing every time you get a rejection and it's also very easy to develop bitterness about rejection when you feel it's um, not warranted. And I definitely empathize with that. Um, but if you want to do this job long term, you have to be encouraged by the small steps that you do take. Like if I get a small, you know, I mean, not even small, but if I get any kind of um, success in a contract I'm negotiating, like if I push for something and they let me have it, um, that's really, that's like an exciting small thing to me because I don't know if this is, this project's going to earn out at its, its advance. I hope it does. But if it does, like I just made this easier for the author in the future. Um, or, you know, if we hear, I don't know, even hearing, you know, uh, I'm so excited about this. I want to take it to my boss. Like, obviously that's not a guarantee, but that is something to say, okay, that's, that's like a good thing that we should be able to like celebrate a little bit. And you think about how excited the author is too. And that's a part of my job to like try and advocate for and sympathize with the author whenever I can. So I, those moments make me a more effective advocate. Um, and I try to let myself feel the joy of those moments, which is inspiring to me, which again, sounds like a very strange <laughs> thing, but I think that's largely where I find the most um, moments of joy that make me want to keep going in the job. I think writers would totally agree with everything you just said from their own perspective, because those little wins do carry the day. I had one more question and it slipped my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I no idea what it was going to be. I'm like, oh, this was the perfect ending question, but I don't remember what it was. Um, I'm sorry, I went on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what it is. Tell me the, the moment you saw something that you pushed really hard for on a bookshelf. Describe that moment. Well, uh, strictly speaking, it hasn't happened yet. I mean, books of my, a, the first book that I ever sold is out, um, but I just hadn't had the opportunity to see it in the world, um, just for many reasons. Um, but I will say that I, the first time that was, I think was even more significant than that, than the idea of seeing it on a shelf was just like receiving the physical copy in general, like to be able to be like, oh, like this is real. And like, not only just like seeing it on a shelf, which is really wonderful, but like 
being able to get it sent to me and knowing, oh, like I did that. Like I, like this is, I'm holding this because it was sent to my office because I sold this book. <laughs> like that's like a very cool and exciting thing. And like, I certainly don't begrudge the excitement of uh, seeing it on a shelf either. Um, and once I get there, we will reassess. Um, but I think just like receiving the physical copy of any book um, that I've sold is really exciting. Also, I received a, an advanced copy of another book I, I sold this week. So it was like, that that's what's been on my mind. Um, because also, you know, we can't really go out right now. <laughs> so the idea of seeing a book on a shelf in a store is like a little bit distant for me at the moment. Um, so just receiving any physical evidence of a lot of work um, is like, oh, yes, okay. This, this does have this payoff at the end of the day. You are doing this for a reason. Uh, and I do love what I do. And even if those moments of physical and tangible progress are a little fewer and farther between, they do come. And this is a long game. I want to be in this industry for a long time. It's easy to burn out, but I just, I want this to, you know, develop over the long term. Well, Alyssa, this has been a great interview. How can people get in touch with you? Well, they can uh, email me if, if they, once I reopen to queries, they can email me at submissions at stonesong.com. If they have any questions about what I represent, they can go to my profile on stonesong.com, which has a very comprehensive list of what I do, the people I represent, in case you're familiar with any of their work. Um, also, they can check out the, my manuscript wish list profile on the manuscript wish list site um, or my tweets. Uh, I'm at twitter.com slash Alyssa Jeanette, and I typically post a lot about the business and a lot about books and about the things that I'm looking for. Uh, my DMs are always open in case people do have questions, but try to look at my other profiles first to see if any of those questions are answered before you reach out. All right, and now Alyssa, are you ready to switch gears and move to our rapid fire questions? I think so. <laughs> have you ever been slutting? Yes. All right. Uh, but, I mean, not for a long time, but yes, I have been sledding. All right. And, and in the same vein, you're in New York City. Do you go ice skating? I have never been ice skating in the city. I do go to Rockefeller Center every, almost every year for, to see the tree, and I watch people ice skating. And this past winter, there was a little rink down at World Trade Center, and I watched people, but I have never actually done it myself, which is pretty silly. I've lived here a while. <laughs> I should go ahead and do it. And are you a podcast junkie? I'm not. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not, it's not for a lack of desire. I do enjoy podcasts. Um, I, I just tend to be a music listener. Like whenever I'm on my commute or wh whenever I was on my commute back when I commuted, um, music for me is just a way to like not think about stuff. I can just focus on what I'm listening to and really enjoy that. Um, I do love a podcast. My husband and I will listen to some together sometimes, um, but typically I just have a hard time keeping up. But I do enjoy everything I've listened to and has, that has been recommended to me. I'm just very bad at committing. Well, this one will be very highly recommended to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, no, I'm definitely looking forward to listening to a few of these now that I've been on the show. I'm very excited. Well, what's on your music playlist right now? Well, for my uh, early 2000s, um, like anyone who was in high school in the early 2000s, uh, I'm a pretty big uh, Fall Out Boy fan. Pretty much anything pop punk, I'm very into. Although, oh, I did just buy a turntable for the first time, and my one of my first record purchases uh, is sort of like a childhood favorite of mine that my dad kind of like introduced to me, which is Abandoned Luncheonette, uh, the album by Colin Oates, and it is one of the best albums ever, beginning to end. I highly recommend it. Um, so that's, there's a, that's kind of like the spectrum. I also just received a Simon and Garfunkel record in the mail. <laughs> so, you know, the, from like pop punk to like 70s folk, basically. <laughs> it's, it's a broad spectrum and like anything pop as well. I love it, I love it, absolutely. Alyssa, thank you so much for stopping by. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This was lovely.
you all have been listening to another episode of the Florida Writer Podcast with your host, Allison Nissen. Allison out. Alyssa Jeanette joined Stonesong in June of 2015 after interning at the Sarah Jane Freeman Literary Agency. She grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and graduated from the Maryland Institute College of Art with a BFA in illustrations in 2010. Alyssa now represents children's and adult fiction, picture books, graphic novels, and select pop culture nonfiction. She values diversity and inclusion. In fiction, she also enjoys ensemble cast with distinct voices, stories about four characters, communities, and formats that are considered, that are specific to a story and give it its own context. For more information on Alyssa, visit her at stonesong.com. For more information about the Florida Writers Association, visit us on the web at floridawriters.net.